Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Cafe. Grab your cup of coffee or your tea, sit back, and let's chat about the happenings in the stars today. And oh my gosh, guess what? This morning I walked outside and number one, it was really chilly. It was icy out there. But number two, I looked up and what drew me outside was the moon and the planet Jupiter very close together in the sky, just like twinkling at me. So I went and I got my trusty, you know, star app, the star 3D map. And uh, also Saturn sitting there with the pair. So Saturn, so Jupiter, here would be the moon. Jupiter was just a little bit down this way and Saturn was up this way. Gosh, gorgeous, right? Just before the sun came up and I lost sight of the two. If I had looked further, I might've been able to see Venus out there, but it got too cold. <laughs> so, I, so I came inside, <laughs> but it was so beautiful. And any time that I have the opportunity to be able to see, connect visually with what's going on up in the sky, I absolutely take that opportunity. And remember yesterday we said that the moon would be conjunct Jupiter. That was part of the energy for yesterday. So what I was seeing was, uh, Jupiter and the moon separating from one another, but they were still really close together and it was still really, really lovely. And, you know, we have to take our chances here up in the Pacific Northwest because a lot of the time the sky is covered in clouds and we don't get to see these wonderful things. So I do go outside barefoot in my tank top and, and, and pajama bottoms to go out <laughs> in the cold to see what's going on up there in the sky because it is, uh, gosh, I don't know. It's just a thing, right? You have to do, you have to be able to go out and see what is going on up there. So I hope everybody's having a great day so far. We moved out of the void, of course, moon at 7.08 this morning, my time, 10.08, your time if you're on the East Coast. And now we are with the moon in Capricorn. So it fundamentally shifts the energy of the day from the more adventurous, optimistic side uh, that Sagittarius brings to us to the more down to earth business practical side that Capricorn brings to us. So you may feel that shift through yourself and your own attitudes in the day, but you also might experience that from the people that you work with or the people that you are out and about in the world with. Now that doesn't make this a particularly bad day. It just, it just changes the way that we are emotionally connected to things today. I, I even this morning was thinking to myself, you know, I've got this to do, I've got that to do. I was like making my little plan where yesterday after I got off air here, with you all in the morning, it was time spent with my daughter. We went and had some lunch together, uh, she, by the way, at Sagittarius. So it was, you know, perfect, right? I was going to use the last energy of Sagittarius hanging out with my Sagittarian daughter. And we had a great time. And then I came back and I did the April webinar last night for those of you in the membership. It was a great day. But today I feel like, okay, better get my list out, better get, you know, these things done and I feel more organizational. So attitudes shift when the moon makes a move from one sign to the other. However, today is not necessarily, like I said, a bad day or you know, even a day where it's all work and no play because there are some other types of energies going on today that help to kind of keep us from going all the way over to the serious end of things and sort of staying balanced in you know, work and play. But first, let's say good morning to everybody out there. Good morning, Vicki, it's good to see you this morning. And Debbie tibbetts Tumiel, Vanita, good morning. Rebecca, good morning. Willa, good morning. It is great to see you out there and anybody, there's other people out there I see, they haven't checked in with us, however, so good morning to all of you. So let's take a look then at what makes the day a little bit lighter than what we might expect with the moon in uh, uh, Capricorn. Good morning, Linda. She says, I'm up again today. Yay. That's awesome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so today, lightening up the atmosphere some is the fact that the moon is in a really good angle with both Venus and the planet Uranus. So here we have a nice, we have the feeling 
right? That that we we want to play, that we want to have some fun, but we also have that responsibility orientation about the work that we have to do. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean work like in an office or you know at your place of business. It can be that certainly, but it is mostly related to the things that we have to get done, our responsibilities, and that might mean things that you've got to get done at home. Um, I did this quick cleanup of my desk this morning while I was waiting to go on air. Uh, because it had just gotten out of control over the last couple of days. So it's task oriented, right? If I can clean my desk and get this done, then I'm going to feel better about sitting here this morning talking to you all because I won't feel like I am uh, Professor Janet in the, you know, under uh, a cloud of paper and books. There's, there's still a bunch of books here on the floor next to me that you can't see, but that's okay. I will get to those as well. So we have a nice balance in the day as far as the energy of work and play. But now the fact is that uh, the moon in, well, it's actually not the moon, Venus and Uranus are also in a good angle to one another today. They're in a sextile relationship, which is uh, a 60 degree angle. And it is usually where the gifts and talents of one is amenable to the gifts and talents of the other. So they're, they set up a sharing with one another of uh, the energies between the two of them. So today, again, this is putting the focus definitely on work and play. So appropriate response to whatever is showing up in your world. So in this moment, I'm on air with you. I'm focused with you on air sharing this information. In the next moment, I might be, you know, walking over to grab a cup of coffee and have a conversation with a friend. It is focus on whatever is in front of you at the moment today. Now, when Venus and Uranus come together like this, there's also the opportunity for things to happen, excitement between people. You might be meeting new people, and the people that you meet today may have an effect on you. Maybe you've never you know, seen this person in your office or at the grocery store before and you strike up a conversation and out of that conversation, you come away affected in some way. It may be that that conversation changes your attitude about something or expands your, your mind in some way or changes your attitude in some way. Now, I'm not going to say that all of that happens only in the positive, because remember, the other planet here involved is Uranus, and Uranus does things in surprising ways. It could be somebody in your outer world that triggers you, and then you have a response to that trigger. And that still may rock your world in some way, right? Maybe later you're like, why did I overreact to this? Why did that person create that response in me? Um, you know, if you're responsible, of course, and you all are, because you've been listening to me forever, and you know that when something triggers you, you bring it in and you work with it and process it within yourself without blaming or victim, you know, energy around what it is that has happened with you. So today we may have those things that blow our mind. Um, but it is also a day where everyone seems interesting to you and everyone seems interested in you. Great day to be out and about, right? Get out if you can and expand your horizons, maybe go to new places that you've never been. Um, it is also a day, perhaps, where romance blossoms. And Venus Venus Uranus contacts like this can sometimes bring about a love interest or a romantic interest or a romantic interlude that is a, a, a one-time thing, right? Uh, what do they call that? A, a one-night stand sort of thing. But on the other hand, sometimes Venus and Uranus come together like this and create space for a connection, a soul connection. Remember yesterday, Venus moved into Pisces. So she's really looking at the more spiritual connections, the more unconditional loving connections. Uranus in Taurus is also more grounded and is also thinking more along the lines of loyalty, trustworthiness, and long term. So maybe for some of you, it may be romance in the air, maybe a, a relationship that you're in taking the next step, going deeper, or maybe it is even sometimes in this case it could be a breakup where you both realize we are not a fit we are not a match and we walk away from one another amicably enough 
right? It's not necessarily a bad thing. And you both realize that. So it's an interesting mix of energies we have today with Venus, Uranus, and the moon in Capricorn. Now, the moon is also in a nice relationship to both of those planets. So that's why I think really it's more on the positive side as opposed to the more negative possibilities. But all of that really is dependent on what it looks like in your own personal chart. Venus could be in a house. Let's say Venus is in the fifth house. Now, that could ramp up not only love and romance, but it could also ramp up creative expression. It could create more joy in your life through something. And uh, maybe, you know, a person or through something that you've learned or an interaction that you have with someone. So it, it depends when, when I'm sitting here in the morning and I'm talking to you about these things. These are general energies, right? I'm just saying what the possibilities are. But your chart is a unique signature for you. And the only way to really know what's going on for you personally is to know your chart. You can do that in a couple of ways. You can have a reading, right? You can have a, an astrology reading or a human design reading, and you can get some clarity about what's correct for you. What is the chart look like for you? Or you can even join up to my new membership, Living Astrology Academy, and throughout the next months, we are going to be taking a deep dive into some of the parts of your charts, human design. I even have something new that I'm going to bring up to everybody. We've talked about the Black Moon Lilith before, but I discovered something new that affects our light and our dark in our charts and how we express our shadow and how we, what we have within us, the intrinsic thing within each one of us that brings us to the light. And I can't wait to share that. It will be shared with the membership first. If you want to join the membership, go on to uh, the Living Astrology Facebook page. And I posted the link yesterday to for you to be able to join that membership. $13 a month. You get the monthly webinars. You get a monthly forum where we can come together with your charts and look at what is going on in your chart as well as enabling you to ask questions about it. And there are special events and also then uh, the Living Astrology Academy Facebook page that is a, a sort of private group where we can work with one another on things that are happening. All right. Now, what else is happening today? Venus. I thought I'd take a look at the the placement of Venus and Uranus in human design, kind of giving us a little bit more access to the themes that might be behind these two planets. But first, I want to take a look and see what people are saying. Other people have checked in here. Good morning, Mimi. Good to see you. Uh, Asa, good morning to you. Colleen, great to see you. Gail, good morning. Camille, I love Camille's name. Camille, love, 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 love. Good morning to you, Camille. And let's see, if anybody has any questions, uh, any ahas or thoughts that come up, please feel free to write them in the chat and I'll take those up in a few minutes. So let's take a look at Venus and Uranus now and where they're placed in human design. So yesterday when we talked about Venus moving into Pisces, I also told you that yesterday was the last day she would be at gate 30, which was the gate of desire and want and not necessarily, really it has nothing to do with sexual desire at all. It is more the desire of the things that we feel inside of us where we might have holes that we feel like are like a prosperity hole or a relationship hole or a, a job or career hole, that void that is in us that we have this wanting. And Venus at that gate was calling that up for us. And there's a really good reason that she would precede the gate she's in today by that gate. Uh, gate 30, because we need to know what it is that we want, what is down there, what is in the desire part of us, right? We all have desires, we all have that uh, void that we are trying to fill, and we are filling it with various things. Some people may be filling it with love and romance, other people may be filling it with education and, and knowledge, other people may be filling it with meditation and yoga and, you know, uh, spiritual connection. Some people are filling it with sex and other people, maybe not you guys, are filling it with drugs or alcohol, depending on if you're expressing these energies in the positive or in the negative or the low frequency or the high frequencies. 
The point is, though, we all have something that we want that we desire. Now, today, Venus moves into the gate 5555, the gate of abundance. In human design, it is the gate where everything comes to us because of our intrinsic value and worth, not because we must do anything. The uh, the gate 55 sits on the emotional solar plexus. The, the center for work is the sacral. So why would abundance and the birthright that we have of abundance sit on the solar plexus and not be on the sacral? Because it's all about how we feel, our attitude, our emotions. So Venus now will be highlighting those emotions that might be standing in the way of our having the ability to fulfill those desires, those wants. Okay, so that's why this is following uh, on the gate from the gate 30. And interestingly enough, too, it is only in our minds, our minds have created the space. The mind is very far away from the sacral and from the emotional center. But it's been in the mind that we've been thinking that we have to do in order to receive. Right. That has been an artifact of mis. Uh, mistaken motivation. That's a term that we use often in human design when we have mistakenly, either through conditioning, which mostly comes through conditioning, or our thought processes, put emphasis on something that is incorrect. So here we put a lot of emphasis on the fact that we must do, and when we do, then we receive. And it isn't true, right? Receiving has nothing to do with doing. It doesn't mean that you don't receive when you do things, but it isn't the prerequisite to getting what you want in your life. The prerequisite for getting what you desire is to adjust your attitude and your emotion to be able to receive that. And that might mean adopting an attitude of gratitude. It might be about you adopting a giving attitude so that then you're also in receiving and it could be many different things, but it all traces back to your emotions and not to your working. And I know that's like a tweak, right? We've got to change the way that we look at that. And it begins with you changing your mind about what it looks like to receive. Uh, Gail, woohoo! I'm feeling these energies in these gates for yesterday and today. And literally, Gail, this is on for the next five days for us. So it's not just today. Venus is going to sit here for a few days. And we have the opportunity then to not only work with this energy and deal with our attitudes and our emotional connection, but Uranus in all of this is sitting at gate three. Now, gate three, remember, well, I guess I brought this up last night in the webinar, that gate three is really a gate of change, mutation. So maybe it's more about mutation. When I, I know if I say change, you guys think about maybe it being, you know, a conscious thing that you can do, but it really is much more about mutation. And there isn't a whole lot that you can control in gate three. It's in your genes. It's in your DNA. And with a planet like Uranus that is an awakener, that is a, you know, sometimes shocking us into awaking um, or causing rebellion where we are just out, out to reject everything that's always been in favor of opening up to something new. It is about freeing ourselves, right? And in it, at gate three, we are freeing ourselves to the very foundational energy of who we are in our DNA. And so from that standpoint, there really isn't a whole lot you need to do, except be open to what the universe is showing you as the next steps, the next path in our evolution. Really, when I look at gate three, it's often, um, it's a place where innovation and inventiveness and newness comes up. And sometimes that energy works, and it becomes something that creates that evolutionary leap. And other times it's maladaptive and it doesn't work. And so it may be something we start out with and then we reject. It's like um, the beta versions of programs. Remember way back in the day, gosh, now I'm showing my age kind of, but most of you might remember something about 
uh, VCR tapes, videotapes, VHS, I think it was called versus uh, beta. And was it beta? Yeah, beta versus VHS. And it ended up that beta wasn't particularly adaptive. It didn't catch on. It was a maladaptive mutation. And VHS, which arose at about the same time, took over. And all of the machines and so forth that were being built that could use that were um, were for VHS and not for beta. So it sort of moved that energy out of there. So that's kind of what happens within us as human beings, right? A, a, a genetic mutation comes up and we may not even ever know that this is happening, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't create an adaptation. And I want to, I want to, I wonder, I wonder, this isn't me knowing anything specific except one thing that uh, Ra Uruhu, who, uh, who channeled in, brought in, transmitted the, um, the human design information, once said that we would know that we were as humans undergoing a very big mutation when we started seeing the levels of autism increase. Now, he was saying this in the mid 80s before the idea of autism really took you know root it wasn't until like 93 94 mid 90s late 90s and early 2000s where that really busted into our awareness this idea of autism and i'm i wonder if that isn't the harbinger of that mutation the very foundational mutation taking place in our solar plexus where we have to reconnect to our emotional body and use that as our authority. And it is a huge mutation that we're undergoing and it doesn't happen overnight, right? We can take the leap, you know, once we get so far over to the fulcrum point, we tip it over and it becomes the mutation that is the standard. Just like at some point VHS took over from beta and it became the standard for watching movies, right? So at some point the emotional center is going to be that point that takes over and becomes the guide, the, the guiding energy for our authority. How do you feel? And not how necessarily from the mind, but does it feel good? Does it feel correct? Does it feel right? Does it make me happy? Does it make me filled with joy when I think of doing this or having that or being there or getting involved with this relationship? That's where we're headed. The gate three, where Uranus is sitting is putting that in play, right? It has been putting this in play for us behind the scenes. And now we have Venus at gate 55 and that mutation has something to do with our ability to be abundant, to have what we want without having to go to filling up that void with just things and stuff and sound and whatever else it is that we put in there to keep ourselves from feeling that void. I hope all of this is making sense to you. It is, it's very deep stuff. This is where we are crossing into some of the more deeper transitional energies that we are a part of, but also just taking it from the surface, what we have is change that is going to drive how it is that we see ourselves in the world as abundant beings. And, you know, this is a short term transit. Really, Venus is only here five days take the most of it, right? Make the most of it. Look at your life and where it is that you're out of alignment with who you want to be, what you want in your life, whether it's financial, whether it's relationship, whether it's work, whether it's uh, real, uh, having uh, access to new ideas and education, etc. Take a look and see that uh, in a new way. Uh, good morning, Diana Bulgard. And Rebecca says, goes really well with the North Node being in Cancer, right? Yeah, it does, right? Because um, the North Node in Cancer is spotlighting places where we've been security oriented, where we've had the hard shell around us, where we've been protective and not so much open to new things and exciting things. So in a way, the North Node in Cancer is sort of acting like the uh, the guard that is going to let in what feels right and what's working and keep out the old. So we have 
or, or keep out the things that are maladaptive and not working. So we have this, this ability right now with that transit to uh, tap into discernment, right? What is correct for me? What is not correct for me? So easy deals, easy deal, Mamie. Camille says, yes, I was intrigued by autism in college, asked my psychology professor about where to go to focus on the study of it. He rolled his eyes at me, told me that it was so rare that there were not specific courses on it. This was in 79 and 1980. Wow. Right. So this really and, and Ra Uruhu brought human design in in 1986 or 1987 i can never remember which year and uh autism seemed to spike after that time period right where it just shot up and came into our awareness and it, my understanding of autism is that there's an issue going on with how that individual with autism deals with the emotions deals with uh, either they are at one end of the spectrum where they just can't handle emotion and it and it you know fritzes them out or they you know get overly emotional um, or at the other end where they don't have the ability to really feel emotion and there's a lot of theories about why that might be whether it was vaccinations whether it was overly overstimulation in the uh, outer world that they come into i don't know all of the ins and outs about it but Ra's point was that that would be the harbinger, the first signs that we were shifting, transmitting, transforming, uh, uh, mutating into the emotional solar plexus um, uh, mutation that's occurring in human beings. So are gene keys and gates two separate things? Great question, Vicki. They are not. They are the same. So in human design, what is gate three is gene key three in, in the gene keys. The difference between the two systems, if you will, is that human design is, um, what's the word I would be? It is, it is not multi-level. It, it has an energy to it, right? It's a trait. It's a personality trait. In the gene keys, we see that personality trait through three levels. We see it holographically. We see it through a shadow. We see it through the gift. And we see it through the highest potential that it has to be expressed in the world or through humans. So the gene keys is a little bit deeper. And we see things then like gate three um, arranged in a different way. So gene key three or gate three in human design, it is just called uh, transformation. It's actually called mutation. There's been a couple of different names for it. In human design, it is just that one sort of energy and it plays out in different ways, but it's that one energy. In the gene keys, it is the shadow of chaos and it is innovation in the gift and it is innocence in its highest expression. So we can view ourselves and our journey as human beings, our journey of the evolution of consciousness through those three levels in the gene keys, where in human design, it's not that handy to be able to see what that is. Does that make sense? I hope so. Mimi, while I'm waiting for Vicky to see if that makes sense, Mimi says it does make sense. Also, considering that autism, ADD, ADHD, indigo, crystal, and rainbow children are often confused or mislabeled for the moment. Evident change in our younger generation. Absolutely. The younger generation, I mean, if you've got uh, grandchildren and you're you know, somewhere maybe in your 40s and 50s, um, you notice how easily they take to telephones, to computers, to Kindles, to uh, laptops, to anything. Anything that has to do with uh, 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 electronics, they just take right to it. I had my 18 month old uh, granddaughter ordering things off Amazon when she was, you know, she picked up the Kindle and she's like, oh, I like that. Presses on that and gets it. You know, it ended up being kind of amusing how that happened. But the point is they have no fear around these. They just naturally move through it. If you look back at what your particular generation naturally did that your parents didn't do, right? We see, you can see how evolution is moving us along um, with every generation. 
So what is autism? What is ADD and ADHD? It is likely an artifact of a deeper uh, DNA change that is happening within our uh, human body. And, you know, many, many people have many different ideas about what happens next. And we've been homo sapien for a long time. I happen to think that we are moving toward what I called homo luminous, the light bodied human. And I know I hear other uh, homo names written, uh, you know, in, in writings that people do uh, describing what will be the human being of tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. But I think there's something even better going on here that um, through the times that I was out in the world talking to people about the Mayan calendar and people were frantic about it coming to this end, right? It was right about 1986, actually, where we came to this point in time where we only had 25 years left in the calendar um, from in, in that iteration of the calendar or the calendar age that we were in. And it is the time where time sped up from about 1986 on, time seemed to be picking up speed, right? It was going faster and faster. And almost like, you know, it was going faster and faster to an end point, right? As points come together, right? It gets faster. The speed appears to be faster. It really wasn't moving faster. It just appears to because it's like moving in and to, to a crescendo. And at that point, when we came to the end of that Mayan calendar round, it was as if puppet strings had been cut. This was through the work of Johann Kalman and his looking at the calendar from a 16 billion year cycle of evolution for the solar system, for the planet Earth, for the life forms on Earth, or the literal uh, jump into life forms being here on Earth, all the way up through human beings. And at the end point here, what was it that was happening? Well, everything that we needed in order to become self-aware, to be conscious, to become co-creators, had been already gifted to us as human beings. There wasn't any other force in the universe at this point that was going to affect change upon us. A lot of what happened from before 2012 back in time was all part of a plan. It was all part of a sort of blueprint of energies that would be revealed one after the other, building upon us, building the template that we are now as human beings. So then they cut those strings. And what happens? Well, we go a little crazy, right? We go a little crazy. We are not feeling the force of evolution in as uniform of a way as we felt it before then. That is maybe not in your conscious mind, but your subconscious knows full well that something's changed and that we are now a freer being than we were prior to 2012 and or 2011, because I happen to think of the date of the end of the calendar as October 29th, 2011. And there's good evidence to point to that as well and not the winter solstice of 2012. The whole point is that now we are in charge of where we go. We can devolve and go backwards through hate and racism and uh, reliving the great of, uh, things of the past, or we can go forward and we can create with a God energy. And I don't mean God in a religious sense, God as the representation of love, of all of the potential for who we are. That's the energy that we can move forward with at this point. Conscious co-creators with God. And if we unpack that, what that means is you're responsible now for what is going on. The underneath the surface work is being done, but we are the expression of all of that uh, mutation and that transmutation and that transformation that is happening. Literally transfiguration is a potential through here as well, where we move from homo sapien into homo luminous or whatever comes next in our own lifetime, right? Where we are not having to be stuck in the 
uh, evolutionary round of life after life after life, like generations succeeding, that we can consciously choose to become something more. And it's really exciting to think of that, that it is a choice, that we all have that ability and it's there for us, but we need to get ourselves out of the way, our minds out of the way in order to be able to embrace that and do work with that. Um, let's see, Vicki asks another question. Yes, more in depth with gene keys. Definitely, definitely more in depth with the gene keys. And the gene keys, the gene keys are very much like yesterday's questions that I gave you for the gate 55 from Rosie Aronson's work on the wisdom keepers in that it they they stir something within you right there there are questions for contemplation that i posted yesterday for you but in that the gene keys themselves are all about a contemplation it is taking whatever energy that you might be working with today we're working with this uh the idea of abundance of what that abundance leads us to which is freedom remember in the gene keys the gate 55 is the victimization energy in the shadow, freedom in the gift and freedom in the city. And in human design, that's about abundance. So how does abundance and freedom work together? Well, imagine your life when you don't have enough resources to do what you want, right? It stymies your freedom. And then that tendency to then become a victim of your circumstances pops into your field. And we've lived that victim We've lived it. We don't need, we, we are so done with the experience of being a victim that we can leave that behind and instead engage in the concept of freedom. And I urge you, if you have the gene keys, to take on the gene key 55. It's deep. It's probably one of the most written about gene keys of all. So anytime a planet, like in this case, Venus, plops itself down at that gene key, I am taking note because it's the next level, it's the next step in the evolution of consciousness toward becoming more abundant and more free. Hope that makes sense to everybody. Uh, Rebecca says, empowering, been contemplating on the prefix trans a lot lately. Thank you. Right, there's a lot of trans, a lot of trans, lots of things, whether it's transgender or whether it's transmutation, uh, transformation. Uh, transfiguration. We have a lot of words moving around in our vernacular right now with that. So that's interesting that you're picking that up. All right. So any other questions about human design versus gene keys? That was sort of the short version of that, but um, they work together, but in different ways. The gene keys does not set about to talk to you about your open centers or your defined centers or your channels that connect them or your hanging gates versus your defined or your open gates. That's human design's realm. Gene keys goes right to the depth of each one of those traits and invites us to a contemplation of how we bring out the higher frequency expressions of each of those gates. Hopefully that helps too. All right, last but not least for today, and if you have questions, still feel free to type them in. I'll be happy to, to talk about them. Um, today is the day we bring the sun and the moon into a challenging square with one another. And we know this as the crisis of consciousness. So today we come face to face with the inner shift that we must make in order to be able to continue on whatever it is that we set out at the new moon to achieve our intentions. And that crisis of consciousness is a point in time where we throw out what isn't working in favor of what is working. It is a time for us to sort of prune things away. It might mean that you are having to deal with attitudes or with a uh, belief or with old information, grudges, uh, all, all of the past, right? And you may need to release some of that in order to be free to move ahead. So it has to be that we are willing to look at what works and what it is that we need to let go of in order to keep moving forward with our intentions, with our manifesting, right? The new moon back early in March, March 6th, we are now at March 27th. So if we look at each week, 
we're coming through that cycle of the moon. We went from the new moon, then we had the first quarter moon, which is the crisis of action. Then we have the full moon where we can release, let go, complete. And now we have this moon where we can do a shift on the inner plane, whatever it is that we've been thinking about that's holding us back, an attitude or whatever that has to shift. And what can we let go of to be freer, to move forward, creating the world that we want, right? That's the high side of this. It can feel a bit like a crisis though, as you meet up with parts of yourself that have been holding you in check, that have been holding you down, that have been holding you from moving forward. There's lots of little things, little things sometimes, right? Sometimes you might be hearing some self-talk. This is where I often find uh, what's going on with me is what do I hear myself saying to myself when I don't do something right, when I forget to say something or, you know, I start to browbeat myself. And I'm sure a lot of you do this in, in many different ways, both very uh, aware of it and sometimes very much not aware of how that is working in your life. But when you catch yourself doing that, those are the moments, right, where you can see what it is that you need to shift on the inner world. Because words have power, thoughts have power. And if the thought you're thinking or the words you're saying about yourself are not so positive, happy, and you know, uh, uplifting, then you're dragging yourself down and you're dragging down your expression of who you are. If on the other hand, you catch it and you change that, then you set yourself on a new trajectory. That is what the crisis of consciousness is, right? So what, go back to March 6th, what was it that you set out to accomplish? What was your intention with that uh, uh, new moon that you wanted to connect with, right? It was the new moon in Pisces, and it was a moon that was taking us more to the spiritual end of things, to creative and imaginative energy. What was it that you imagined you could create that now you may you may be at various levels of uh, having uh, gotten that done, but what is it that's still hanging there holding you back, right? What is it that you haven't seen yet? So take the moment, look at that, let it go, move on, right? Okay, uh, let's see, any other questions out here this morning? Uh, nope. And I'll wait for a few seconds here. Now, today, this afternoon, 4 o'clock p.m. my time, so that is 7 o'clock on the East Coast, I will be appearing on the Angel Heart Radio blog talk show. And today we're going to look at what the uh, spring, their fall, because this is a group out of Australia, their fall equinox is setting up for these next three months. So we're going to take a skim across uh, the spring, fall equinox and the next three months and what that might be bringing up. And uh, that will be again at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. East Coast time. The cool thing about doing uh, Annette's show is that I get to do readings for people on air. So if you would like a mini astrology reading or a mini human design look at your chart, call into the show at between 4 and 5 p.m. or between 7 and 8 p.m. and uh, East Coast time and get your chart right? Get your, get a little mini reading. I only have time to do usually just one question, um, but feel free to be able to do that. As soon as I'm done here this morning, I will post that up on the Living Astrology Facebook page, and uh, you can then connect with uh, how to, how to get a hold of us during that. Um, I think that is it for me this morning. How about you guys? Anything else? Camille, sweet. And Vicki, thanks. That did help. Good, good, good. I'm so excited that, you know, things help. You know, I, I want to make sure everybody understands. When I come on air here in the morning, it isn't me showing up in at the beginning of a conversation about astrology right? Because we've been doing this for many months, since August of 2017. Some of you have been with me right from the beginning. And so you've seen how this has progressed. You've seen how we've taken, you know, some steps and, and introduced into new concepts. And, and you may have more working knowledge of what I'm talking about in the morning than others of you who are newer. So I want you all who are newer 
to this information, not to get disheartened about not knowing as much as other people do, ask questions, right? When you ask questions, I respond. <laughs> I love questions. And if I can't answer it in a, you know, quick way, then I can even turn the, the, more, the next morning broadcast into an answer for that question. So I really ask you to, if you have questions, if you are confused, if you have no clue what I'm talking about when I'm talking, please ask a question. My daughter and I were in the car yesterday and we're having a question. We, I was telling her about an opportunity that I have that's coming up. And she said, well, I got to tell you, mom, sometimes you're talking about things and I have no earthly clue what you're talking about. And I said, well, did you ask a question about what it is? Or did you ask me to define what I'm talking about? Well, no, I didn't. Well, if I don't know that you don't know, I can't help you. <laughs> so please feel free. You can email me livingastrology111 at gmail.com. I will post that up here. And you can ask questions. Hold on, living. I can't do too many things at one time. Mercury still retrograde at gmail.com. There you go. So ask your questions. Don't get frustrated if you are totally confused, if you don't know the difference between the gene keys and the human design and astrology. It will, it will get clearer. The more you're exposed to it, it will get clearer. But if there's something specific that you need help with, let me know. And I will be happy to do that for you. So livingastrology111 at gmail.com for your questions um, or feel free to ask questions here. Vanita card for today. Well, I guess I could do that. Let me see. My decks are over here. What do we want today? Let's do... I also have a goddess deck that I really like. Maybe we'll play with that tomorrow. Uh, let's pull a wisdom of the oracle. Gail, your information helps me navigate my life and my business. Ah, yeah, yeah. I am so happy to hear that, Gail. Thank you so much. Um, it helps me, right? And that's my whole point is, you know, helping people to live their lives in an easier way. Now, you know, having said that, sometimes people might be confused because what I might be saying about the general atmosphere of the day, you may not feel that in your own life. Maybe you felt it a couple of days earlier. Maybe you feel it a couple of days later. And that's just due to the setup of your own personal chart. And this is another reason why you need to know yourself and what that, you know, is for you. I get truth be told, truth be told. And oh, there's another card here. Blessed. Blessed upside down and truth be told right side up. So let's do them both. So truth be told is up, is right side up and it is card number 14. I think we've had this card before. I'm not sure. 14, 14. All right. Truth be told is the essential meaning, honesty, accepting things at face value, coming out of denial the willingness to be transparent and clarity of communication, such a Mercury sort of card, right? Um, the Oracle's message here, there is the truth, which is the essence of a thing. And then there is a truth subjective according to the philosophy of the adherent or believer. This is not a time for debate about which truth is truer. <laughs> this is a time when you are called to proclaim your truth out loud and be willing to be transparent, honest, and open in your communication with others and with yourself. Nothing less than surrender to what is, peeling off the layers of denial that kept you tied to an illusion will set you free. Be authentic and gloriously flawed and spirit will answer with miracles. Love that. Okay, the other card was blessed. It was upside down and card number 22. So a master number, 22. And let's look at that one then and see what that says. Blessed. Oh, that's not it. I passed it. There you are. The essential meaning of the card is something wonderful that is unearned and unexpected. Grace that is an unforeseen gift from spirit. And the protection message is that, oh gosh, this is awesome. 
Humility is called for now as grace is an unearned gift. You didn't gain this by your own desires or actions. To be who you need to be, you can no longer do what you did. In a way, you have hit rock bottom and what is required now is nothing less than total surrender. Then you will be blessed. Letting go of all of that past, just going forward. Love it. So that is blessed and the card called Truth Be Told. An, uh, transparent, another trans, Camille says. Oh, yes. Good, good catch, girl. Um, now let's do, let's pick a spirit animal to go with us on this trip. Um, there's the truth of transformation and blessed with gratitude, uh, transparent transformation. You are right there, Camille. There's a lot of words with trans in front of it. Trans meaning movement, I guess. Have you ever looked up the prefix trans just to see what it means? I bet it means something like movement or moving from one state to another, transformation, changing of the form. And oh, look at this, we get two cards again. This time we get koi, koi fish spirit over here, right side up. There is always enough, card number 36. And upside down armadillo spirit, which says set healthy boundaries. They're both so cute, aren't they? Okay, so let's look at koi fish first. And armadillo spirit was card number three, by the way. So let's look at koi fish 36. The oracle's message is the koi fish who grows big within a small pond reminds us that within each of us is the potential for prosperity. The law of abundance ensures that prosperity is our natural state. So regardless of temporary outer conditions, you can call in prosperity and magnetically attract the opportunities and abundance you need. The message of koi fish spirit is to begin to generate wealth within with deliberate intention, no matter how small your pond may seem and appreciate abundance wherever you see it. Outer conditions will come to reflect your inner prosperity. So begin to become the self who is comfortable with wealth in all forms. Even if at the moment it feels as if riches are not yours, they soon will be. Start to envision the plenty that spirit wants you to experience, knowing that the moment you begin to commit to conscious and deliberate co-creating, spirit will joyfully start bringing you that which you need. You have so much to offer and so much of value to express to the world. In your little pond, there is much you can create and much you can attract. Do not underestimate what you have and who you are, for koi fish spirit wants you to know that you are exquisite, loved, and deeply cherished. Trust that outer conditions are changing to reflect that truth. Wow. That's such a, a, a Gene Key 55 kind of card, isn't it? Now, armadillo, armadillo with that hard outer shell, set healthy boundaries, card number three in protection. So armadillo spirit says, this is a tricky time, as you may find yourself enmeshed with others, overly concerned with how they will take it if you say no, or express how you really feel. Do you feel anxious saying no to someone so you capitulate even knowing the outcome will not be in your best interest? Do you feel like it's your job to stop someone from facing their challenges? Instead, you might take on their responsibilities, rescuing them instead of giving them the freedom to learn their lessons their way. Perhaps you feel that if they only knew how much you cared, they would change and then all would be well. Armadillo spirit asks you to be honest with yourself and others, no matter how difficult that may be or how much you may fear losing someone or something. Face your fear, tell the truth and set your boundaries. You will be amazed at the miracles that happen when you let armadillo spirit protect you from taking on too much, becoming a people pleaser and losing your integrity. Another message of protection from armadillo spirit is to relax, live and let live. 
If you or someone else is being defensive, you are called to step back and trust in spirit's plan. That's kind of a cool card too. All right. So now we have some cards to help us on our way. And I think that is enough for today. All right, everybody, take care. Much love to you all. Uh, tomorrow is Thursday. Uh, is it? Tomorrow is Thursday. <laughs> Somehow I lost a day. Playing yesterday caused me to lose a day. Uh, tomorrow is Thursday, and that means the Ascension and Astrology Show at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. East Coast time. I won't be here in the morning. So where you will find that is on the Ascension and Astrology Facebook page. And I will post that here so that you all can see it here at Living Astrology as well. In the meantime, much love to everybody. Have a great day. Enjoy the sunshine if you got it. Uh, I know we have it and I'm going to love it today. All right. Bye for now.